We welcome the Reeds Collaborative Deaf and Hard of Hearing program into the district. We've lowered class sizes. We're participating in the Race to the Top grant. We've partnered with the Massasoit Community College and Bridgewater State University uh, for dual enrollment of our students. We've participated in a special ed program analysis conducted by uh, Futures Incorporated. We've also participated in the Massachusetts Department of Education's Consolidated Program Review. And you will hear a report later on this evening from Mrs. Paolini about how we did with that. Um, administrative initiatives that have occurred this year. We've implemented a unifund financial system, a whole new package that we are putting into place for accounting, for payroll. That's a major undertaking and we are successfully implementing that. We've also introduced the school lunch point of sale system, which makes it very easy for our parents and our students to be able to uh, pay for their lunches through an automatic, <coughs> automatic system. We've participated in a Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed coordinated review and financial audit and received some commendations for that. We've awarded, we have been awarded over $3.5 million in various grants above and beyond the operational budget. Our facilities initiatives this year have included the high school track being resurfaced along with the help of the Friends of VR. Photovoltaic panels have been installed at the high school. We've installed a 25 foot high fence at the baseball field to protect um, our students and the neighbors. Lightning rods are being installed on this high school. We've installed two new physical fitness centers, one at Bridgewater Middle School and one at the Rainham Middle School. We've developed a 10-year capital improvement plan and we've shared those plans with our member towns. We've developed a preventative maintenance plan. As far as communications and public relations initiatives, Chairman Riley and I co-host the Bridgewater Raynham Connections tele television program, highlighting what's going on in our schools. And I would invite you to turn to that. You'll see a lot of great things going on in our schools. And uh, we have a, uh, another one coming up, I believe, pretty soon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Riley, for that. We also will be launching a new website uh, this summer. Um, if you go on the web and look at our uh, front page or our cover page, it's not as user friendly and as inviting or welcoming as we would like it to be. We want it to be more <coughs> user friendly um, and so we are putting that into place this summer. And we're also changing and implementing a new mass communication system. We will be going with uh, a program called Connect Ed and so we're excited about that. Those are some of the things that we have been busy working on and implementing this year. In addition to the fine job that our staff does every day <coughs> with, uh, instructing our children. So I did want to uh, notify the committee and the audience of the types of initiatives that we have going on. I know this is a partial list. I apologize if there's anyone here in the audience who's doing something really great and I forgot to mention it. But we do have a lot going on. We're making a lot of progress. And I'm very proud and honored to be the superintendent in a district that is this forward moving. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forbes, and thank you for that report. Obviously, a lot of really great accomplishments this <coughs> year. We want to thank you, all the administrators and the staff, the teachers, and the um, supporting staff for making that possible. Thank you. Any comments from any members of the committee? Next in correspondence. Um, we have the anti-bullying uh, program, uh, but we are having some technical difficulties right now. So, oh, are we all set? We are good to go. <laughs> Thank you, I didn't see Mr. Dubois back there. Uh, yes, we will need to move. Uh, before we do, I'd like to just say that last fall, our school took um, the bullying, anti-bullying program very, very seriously. And each school had a different initiative going on. And so tonight, 
we are going to hear the culmination or see the culmination of what the middle schools started and showed the committee, I believe in October. And so we'll get to see the videos that the students and the staff put together. So I invite everyone to enjoy. Thank you. excited to be here to show you the culmination of our anti-bullying program for the 2010-2011 school year. But before I begin, I really want to publicly thank guidance counselors Deirdre Sanchez and Terry O'Brien, who just dove right in and helped me invent, create, and sustain a very viable program. And I really want to heartfelt thanks to Mr. Derek Swenson, who has supported our efforts every step of the way. In fact, he was so helpful that he's even willing to pose for pictures and sing a little tune or two for our <laughs> um, Very quickly, um, back in the fall when our anti-bullying task force was formed, I was really skeptical because it's really hard to tell what middle school kids are going to think is cool and what they're going to think is very not cool. And I was really surprised and very pleased when 35 students came forward in, to support our efforts in creating a safe environment for Bridgewater Middle School for everyone. And um, so what we've done is we, we have such a large number of groups that we split them into three committees, activities and awareness. And I just want to take two seconds to show off some of Mrs. O'Brien's committee's work. She put together pamphlets. And these will be distributed to all parents at orientation next fall. And this is the ABCs of bullying for students and parent, parents. And inside, it has tips for victims, bystanders, bullies, and parents. And every page has resources you can go to to supplement what um, you know the booklet has, and it's just chock full of information. So these will be going out to all the parents. Deirdre Sanchez ran a committee called the Publicity Committee, and she has been working on this brochure that says everything that Bridgewater Middle School has done in an attempt to stop bullying, and these will be distributed to students and parents um, at orientation and we're trying to get more students involved, and this year we're really gonna to try to get parents involved. So I wanted to share those two things. Um, and I think the thing I wanna share the most is how great these kids were. I had more fun working with these 35 students, and, and my little committee was a production committee, I had 15 students, it was a phenomenal experience. Their energy, their drive, their commitment, every week they showed up, all I had to do was give them candy and they were there. <laughs> and they really, their ideas were so fresh and so um, enthusiastic and they were willing to really stand out in the school and become role models. So I really want to thank everyone on the Anti-Bullying Task Force for Bridgewater Middle School for the students and um, they, they've done a wonderful job. The um, movie will speak for itself. I will not go on any longer. I know we have a long agenda, but um, I just want to thank Thank um, Mrs. O'Brien and Mrs. Sanchez once again. Thank you.
The student body was asked to submit posters based on one of three themes. What does bullying look like? What are the consequences of bullying? And what does good citizenship look like? We even had our own rap artist encourage all students to participate in the school-wide contest. And to get all work for the Coons Crisis, and we can bring it into the school's crisis. Right, we are currently working on school-wide surveys and development plans to distribute information on uh, anti-bullying efforts at Virginia. Students have been working very hard to spread the word and are currently preparing a pledge wall. Here, each member of the student body will sign their name to show their commitment to creating a positive school climate for everyone. BMS, fully must up! <laughs> the Activities and Awareness Committee, organized by guidance counselor Terry O'Brien, works to promote a caring, giving, bully-free school environment where all students feel safe and welcome. During the morning announcements, this group of students spreads the word about bullying and urges everyone to treat others the way they wish to be treated. By making a bullying box, students are able to anonymously report incidences of bullying. On whiteout day, all students and staff wore white to signify our commitment to correcting any bullying problems in our school. During Make a Difference Week, Students show thanks to their teachers by making each member of the staff a special flower pen and serving light refreshments in the morning. Each member of the student body will receive a bully bracelet to show that we are a unified front. This committee reached out to all members of our school community by hosting two special holiday events for our life skills students. During this time, these students learned about issues that surround bullying, while at the same time enjoyed party treats and made special holiday cards for their parents. Due to the efforts of these students, colorful signs hang on every classroom door and serve as reminders to our student body that we are working towards a bully-free school. But we haven't stopped here. Incorporating an anti-bullying unit into our health curriculum we adopted the book, Dory Witt, A Guide to Surviving Bullies, by 16-year-old author Bridget Berman. Health teachers Mrs. Aridi and Mrs. Hughes use themes from Bridget's book to teach students about gossip, rumors, verbal bullying, cliques, peer pressure, cyberbullying, and the damaging effect it has on the self-esteem of the victim. When the entire student body had finished reading Dory Witt, we had the distinct pleasure of hosting the young author herself. Bridget Berman, once a victim of bullying, now speaks to students nationwide about her experiences. The table where I usually sat was full, and I wanted to go sit down, and my friends turned away. Apparently there was no room for me. It's painful, it hurts when it's your own best friend. If you're watching the bullying happen, you're just as much part of the bullying as the bully. And speak up for each other. Her powerful words and messages held the attention of 600 students as they learned the value of empathy and human kindness. Together we can be bully. And if you don't know, you have to know. And now for our feature presentation.
rejection, it hurts.
world. Bullies break people's things on purpose. I saw someone pull out someone else's chair, right when they were about to sit down. I saw someone intentionally kick a basketball at someone's face. I had this game. just because they wanted to go to the front of the line. There's this one kid at lunch. He sat by himself the whole time. Never went that once. I saw someone get stabbed with a pencil. Bullies. Make racist or sexist comments.
administrators and also to all of the teachers and students that took part in those projects. Thank you. Forbes, continuing with correspondence. Uh, yes, um, we had a presentation uh, scheduled this evening from our special ed tact group. However, <coughs> Mr. Benjamin, the president, has requested that it be taken off this evening and put on a future uh, school committee agenda. Okay, I have one other letter for the school committee. Thank you so much for awarding me the Samuel B. College and Memorial Scholarship. I really appreciate it. It will come in very handy in paying my tuition and other college expenses. I am attending Northeastern University in the fall and, and, and in a six-year bachelor's doctorate of physical ed therapy program. Without sponsors like you, I might not be able to pursue my dreams. And it signed sincerely Ryan Newton, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Forbes, who's so fortunate with so many scholarships and so many people in the community that either sponsor scholarships or contribute to them. And thank uh, Ryan for his letter. Uh, next, I think, is that your correspondence? Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Moving now um, to public comment. Um, does anyone from the audience wish to address the, audit, the committee at this time? Uh, if you come to the uh, podium and state your name, please. And town. Hi, my name is Mrs. Hunt. Good evening, my name is Dory McLucas and um, I live in Bridgewater and I have a few young ladies um, that would like to do a quick um, update on the NOPE organization that they started. Hi, I'm Abby Belutis, I'm in sixth grade and I'm 12 years old. We're here to talk about NOPE. Um, on June um, 19th, we're going to have a peace walk and it's going to be at Legion Field from 10 to 1. Um, and we're going to um, start off with the national anthem. Um, Capri is going to say the pledge, and um, we're going to talk about what NOPE is. Hi, I'm Capri McLucas. I'm in fourth grade, and I'm 10 years old. And I'm here to tell you about the route and events after the walk. The fruit of the walk is we're going to start at Legion, take a right, circle the Academy building, go up Route 18, and back in Legion. After we, after we get back, we will have a performance by an up-and-coming hip-hop artist named B-Cap and other local Bridgewater bands. After that, we will sign a scroll that has the public pledge on it. Thank you for your time and your support. Um, we hope to see you there. I just wanted to make one comment that um, today, 4,000 notices were distributed K through eight through the BR school district, and everybody should be looking for them from their children's backpacks or um, from their hands. So if you don't get one, please ask them about it, because I know how it goes with notices. And um, thank you for allowing us to update you, and I think we have, um, we'd like to distribute some of the note bracelets to the committee. Capri, go ahead, they're in a rush. <laughs> this is Kathy Lucas. It's always hard to follow my little girls. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say, I wanted to announce that the BRA today met and voted to accept the PEC insurance proposal. 
and that we want to thank the committee. We have had two meetings with the negotiating team, and um, there's been a lot of movement. We're very, very close, and we're hoping that we will finish the job. And so we want to thank you, and we'll see you the 23rd. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Wyman. I am a uh, resident of uh, Bridgewater, uh, 23 Grange Court. I am a Bridgewater Graham graduate from the class of 1982. I am a parent of two graduates of Bridgewater Graham and one uh, son that is uh, still at Bridgewater Graham. And I think the interesting thing about tonight is we're all here based on the first presentation about building self-esteem in our children. And I want for the record to be known that I'm here to raise awareness about a proposal that is captured within the student handbook to raise the GPA criteria for the National Honor Society that I, representing other parents, I want to stress representing other BR faculty members, and representing students are opposed to that change. And hopefully I can articulate that why. I had the fortunate opportunity to meet with Principal Angela Watson and members of her staff who were proponents for the change. I want to stress that I put this in an email to the school committee dated Monday, June 13th, very late at night. And I want to make sure that people understand that I have enormous respect for the school district. I want to compliment all the accomplishments that have taken place in this year alone. I think it's great, uh, based on the first presentation, what we are trying to do, again, to build people up versus break people down. And I am very impressed by the public speaking skills of some of these young women today. So, bravo. And I'd like to just read a very quick caption so that I can make sure that everybody understands that my purpose is respectful and my purpose is meant to be uh, constructive. And this is quoted from my email. As I said, I am sure as educators, you want the best for BR students, as do I, and your intentions are noble. We just don't agree on the process, the outcome, or the benefit for raising Bridgewater Rainham's National Honor Society GPA from a 3.75 today to a 4.0 in the proposal. I want to stress, and I have copies for the committee in case they weren't able to print it. This is the National Honor Society guidelines, and this is copies of our current grading scale and grade classification. I have other copies that can be passed out to the audience. And I want to make sure people understand that these are taken off of websites. This is public information. You can go into any one of these local high school chapters and pull this off of their student handbooks. And I think it's very important for us to understand that the National Honor Society, on the National Honor Society website, has their criteria for scholarship at a 3.0, or an 85 grade point average, or a B grade. That is the national criteria. I have done a comparison of Bridgewater Rainham versus Bishop Stang, versus Brockton, versus Coyle Cassidy, versus Duxbury, versus Mansfield, Sharon, Silver Lake, Taunton, West Bridgewater, and Whitman Hanson. 
I think I've done a pretty good cross-section of public school systems, well-respected, school districts that we lose children to school choice over, as well as other regional districts that are very close and nearby. The point I'm trying to stress, and the question I've asked that I do not get a satisfactory answer to, is provide me the benefit to any Bridgewater Rainham student for raising the GPA from a 3.75 to a 4.0 when the national standard is a 3.0 or an 85 or a B. And you'll see in the grade classification of Bridgewater Rainham, even with the classifications going from four to three, there is no grade point scale change for anybody in an AP course for any of the grades. There is no change for anybody in the prior honors classes, which is now called accelerated, for any of the grades. And S1 is now an academic grade level. They are exactly the same again from a grade scale standpoint. S2 has been eliminated. It has been combined with academic. That is the only area which used to be the lowest curriculum grade scale that has grade inflation due to going from four to three. Our children at Bridgewater Rainham compete not only against the South Shore children, but children across Massachusetts, 50 states, and when you look at the finer universities and colleges across the country, against international students. The National Honor Society matters when you are applying to schools from an academic and an admissions process. It is a check mark, a positive check mark. It's not the only thing that guarantees admittance, it has no way of guaranteeing admittance but it is a constructive, positive, very well-recognized privilege to have on a transcript. And by us raising our GPA to an, basically an A- minus grade for accelerated prior honors and above, puts our Bridgewater Rainham students at a competitive disadvantage. And for people who don't think so, please do your homework. I don't understand for the life of me why we are not proud of a larger percentage of children being in the National Honor Society. I will read you a quote from this is, can quotas or percentages be used to limit chapter size? This is within, again, the website. The answer is no. No to percentages, quotas, as a way to restrict admittance into the National Honor Society. As stated in the handbook, quotas or percentages may not be set to limit membership or chapter size. It is, if determined that the size of the chapter is unworkable, then the cumulative grade point average or other standards can be raised. Historical note, in the early history of the NHS, quotas in the form of percentages of grade level populations did exist in the selection criteria. These guidelines were ruled as fundamentally un there. And decisions made by the National Council, the governing body for the, national, for the honor societies, and thus no longer are valid and acceptable guidelines for chapter selection procedures. I ask you again, and I ask the committee, why would we put our Bridgewater Rainham students at a competitive disadvantage when applying to colleges? And why should we be focused about too many people gaining entrance when a 3.75 and our grade scale is a B plus. Significantly higher than the national standard, and I will remind the audience who might not see this, Bishop Stang is a 3.65. Brockton is a 3.55. Coyle Cassidy is a 3.0. Duxbury, 3.25. Mansfield is an 88 grade. Sharon is a 5.3 on a 6.3 scale. Silver Lake, 3.7 on a 5.3 scale. Taunton, 3.5 on a 5.5 scale. West Bridgewater, it is a grade of an 87. Whitman Hanson, 3.5 on a 4.3 scale. All of these, if you look at their handbooks and you look at their grade classifications, equate to either a B or a B plus. And with that, I hope you respectfully consider my concerns and many of the other parents who unfortunately do the cheerleading uh, celebration and banquet tonight, which is another example of great Bridgewater Rainham you know, results, and the wrestling banquet tonight, again, another example of great results. These things have to be taken into account. And I lastly want to remind you, I have talked to three separate school districts. The other criteria which is tremendously important is citizenship, 
leadership, and character. Those school districts are focused more around those criteria than focusing on raising their scholastic level. And I think after the announcements and after the presentations we saw today on bullying, we should be far more concerned about those criteria as developing the whole student in our national law society than the academic grade point average. And I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Forbes, Chairman Riley, members of the committee. Throughout this past school year, I've had the opportunity to work with the Bridgewater Radio Regional School District's grades five through eight ELA teachers. They are a phenomenal bunch of uh, dedicated professionals, and I would like to thank them for their uh, efforts all year long. Our primary focus this year was to be proactive in preparing for the transition and implementation of the five through eight ELA Common Core Standards. During our morning session of our March Professional Development Day, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, Geraldine Benedict, who presented an outstanding PowerPoint presentation that highlighted the various changes in the ELA Common Core Standards uh, in comparison to our existing Massachusetts State Frameworks curriculum. We then took that incredibly valuable information into the afternoon session and began making the necessary adjustments to our current curriculum maps and made the changes based upon the Common Core changes. 
We then examined those maps and began creating a resource list of instructional materials that we would need to effectively deliver the new curriculum. The most evident needs in our um, resource needs list was that of reading anthologies at both the fifth and sixth grade level. We presently do not have a collective reading series at those grade levels. Our goals in finding anthologies for the fifth and sixth grade were first and foremost that they align to the common core standards. Secondly, that they contain both a combination of fiction and nonfiction materials with a um, focus on nonfiction informational text. And finally, that the series would align and correlate with the existing seventh and eighth grade anthologies, which are the Apprentice Hall, Bronze, and Silver Editions. We reached out to the Pearson Apprentice Hall Publishing Company back in May, and the fifth and sixth grade teachers attended a presentation at that time that was presented by Mrs. Nicole Franks, who's a representative from Pearson. She presented the Reading Street Anthology Series to our fifth grade teachers. The sixth grade teachers were provided with a sixth grade Common Core Anthology by the representative, Mr. Jack Ahern. The fifth and sixth graders have had about a month to review these Common Core Anthologies and um, have had numerous conversations, meetings, and emails going back and forth, both sides of the district, and the teachers at both grade levels have unanimously agreed that they would like to move forward with these anthologies. I do have copies of the anthologies in my manly man bag right there, if anyone <laughs> might, would like to review those. Um, Pearson is actually willing to provide us with free professional development for both grades five and six throughout the summer, and all of our professional development opportunities throughout the 2011-2012 academic year. I have forwarded all of the representatives these dates, and they have tentatively blocked in these dates should these series um, be approved for adoption this evening. Thank you, Mr. Swenson. Dr. Forrester, I recommend to the committee that uh, you vote to adopt the fifth and sixth grade anthology. Do we have a motion to approve the recommendation of Dr. Forbes? So moved. A, a motion by Mrs. Lane, second by Dr. Prelandowski. Any discussion? We need them. We need them. <laughs> Having a fifth grader, I can definitely attest to the fact that we definitely need some more material for fifth grade. So and we do have the funds to pay for them? That is my understanding. Yes, we do have the funds to pay for the series. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. You just made the fifth and sixth grade teachers very happy with their um, handle of the English language. You should be getting some very nice handwritten. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Swenson. I think, uh, Dr. Forbes, we want to, if it's okay with the committee, move up next acceptance of gifts. Yes, that would be uh, a wonderful thing if we could do that. And I would like to ask if the committee approves. Uh, Mr. Lynch to come forward. Sure. Mr. Lynch, principal at the Mitchell Elementary. Uh, Good evening, Chairman Riley, members of the school committee, Dr. Forbes, Metro, members of Central Office Administration, audience members. My name is Brian Lynch, I'm principal of the George Mitchell Elementary School, and I'm here uh, on a special mission tonight to propose the acceptance of a gift. Not only a gift, but it's an endowment. And a lot of times when we talk about endowments, we're talking about people that are no longer with us. But tonight we have the Mel and Paula Shea Children's Endowment and Charitable Trust. I'm going to present this to you, and before I do that, like a good elementary teacher, I'm going to set reading purpose, I'm going to set listening purpose. We have in our audience tonight, Mel Shea. Mr. Mel Shea, thank you for coming, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the endowment you have. No, I'm going to talk a little bit, then you can come on up. How's that? <laughs> I sent a memo to the superintendent uh, describing this endowment. It is called the Mel and Paula Shea Children's Endowment and Charitable Trust. And I'd like to introduce it to you tonight. Uh, the proposed annual endowment to the tune or to the amount of $5,000 will be provided to the George H. Mitchell Elementary School in the name of Mel and Paula Shea. As the preamble of the grant document states, the trust was established in the memory of Paula Shea, who was a resident of Bridgewater and a lifelong teacher for some 50 years. The funds are governed by a board of trustees and are to be used to support, and this is a quote directly from the endowment, 
hope to support and enhance preschool and early childhood programs designed to stimulate a love of literacy and learning for the children of Bridgewater, unquote. The aforementioned Board of Trustees has enthusiastically supported the utilization of the funds designated for the Mitchell School for the use in our after-school enrichment program. More specifically, the monies will be used to provide low-cost and no-cost enrollment options for our Mitchell students and families in program offerings designed to stimulate a love of literacy and learning. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you tonight Mel Shea, who has sat with us, sat with a committee of people, including Evie Galudis, who was in the audience. I, Evie, you still, you still out there? There, Evie's Evie, Evie out there. It was a good friend of Mel's. Mel sat down with us. And Diane Power, who's the director of the Bridgewater After School Enrichment Program. We sat down on a number of occasions to talk about how this sort of rolls out. But we are very proud, and I propose the acceptance of the gift to you. But before that, I would like Mel Shea to come up and say a couple of words, if you would, Mel. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. I don't know what we would have done, uh, what I would have done, if it hadn't been for some people like Brian, um, for Diane Powers, uh, for Evelyn DeLutis, who, who I call our master architect of working with the university, working with the elementary schools, working with the public library, and putting together a variety of programs uh, for children from the ages of K through three. Uh, my wife was a teacher for a good 50 years. Uh, she left high school to become a nun. She was a nun for 13 years. Uh, she left the, the convent the 1960s were crazy people, like crazy years ago. <laughs> Some crazy people too. But it was, a, it was a, a time of great unrest in the Catholic Church. And for a number of women who were wearing robes yesterday and wearing dresses today, it was a very difficult transition. And there was some silly stuff going on that my wife didn't want to be really engaged in. She was interested in teaching children. She came to uh, Easton. Uh, she worked there for, I think, a good, oh, well, close to 40 years uh, in, in Easton as a teacher. And a good number of those, she was acting principal. When a, t a principal was missing, they wanted Paula to be there. Uh, this business of K through three, uh, I think, would have been very meaning for, meaningful for Paula because we had both talked about the ages around six years, six years of age. And she was convinced, and I was convinced, that what you were seeing at six years, the product that you had at six years, the drive for education, the interest in education, or perhaps the lack of interest in education, was not something that was easily dropped 10, 12, 15 years later. It frequently was a reminder to teachers that this is what we may be looking at here, unless some very special things take place. So that K through three uh, was important. Um, Paula died, oh, less than 10 months ago. Uh, I was a basket case for two months. Uh, I, I couldn't even function. Uh, after about that period of time, though, I started to realize that that I had to stop feeling sorry for myself and do something useful. And a dozen years, oh, 13 or so years ago, Paula had asked me, she said, I would like, Mel, when one of us dies, uh, to leave the bulk of whatever we have uh, to children, uh, to children's learning, and to the public library here, the, and the children's room, basically, <clears throat> in the public library. Uh, 
I said, sure, fine, no problem. Uh, this lady was 12 years younger than I was. She was going to be wheeling me around in a chair, you know, and she could take care of all this stuff uh, uh, after I was gone, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, and the amazing thing was, uh, I started thinking, okay, how are we going to get these building blocks together? And uh, I had dealt with uh, Dana Moeller far even when he was vice president uh, a few years earlier. And I went over to him and I sat down there with him and talked and I said, Paul has died, this is some of the things she's wanted to do. I would like to see if we could get some building blocks for children's learning programs that we could begin for the coming years and they could go on perhaps for a lifetime or more here. Uh, and I would like to know, I'd like to see if we could get the university to be involved in children's learning programs. I'd like to see if we could get the public library and the children's room involved. I'd like to see if we could get the elementary schools involved. And uh, I said, I'm wondering, I got a couple questions. I wonder, first of all, if the university would be interested in, we, we, you could participate in this. And my second question is, and he interrupted me. And he says, you want to know my answer to the first question? And I said, okay, all right. He says, the answer is yes. And that, that yes was translated next to the public library, the board of trustees, very, not just interested, but anxious. Anxious in, in a way that, uh, and also with the elementary school. And the enthusiasm that I found uh, to do these things uh, and to put these building blocks together uh, is just incredible. Uh, and I could have never done it. Gee, I went eight years ago, I went over to Joyful uh, School of Learning and I said, I'll volunteer, I'll help in classes. I'm a smart guy, you know, I could work with these kids here. And uh, there were three young boys there that needed some help and so they were assigned to me. And uh, I worked with them for two or three days, and it was like talking to rocks. <laughs> I have no talent at all for, for this whole business called teaching. There was nothing I could do there. I used to tell my own kids, you know, I had, I had six kids, and I'd say, oh, you want to get out this Saturday, you know, you want, to, uh, do, you want a couple bucks to spend? Fine. Here's a to-do list. Uh, when you're through with the to-do to -do list, but, you know, show it to me and we'll see what we can do. It always worked. I thought that's the way things worked, you know, and um, none of that seemed to work in the school system. There's other talents, obviously, that are required here. Um, but of all of the, these programs, um, Brian and Diane Powers and Evelyn, we've got I think the most wonderful array so far. Uh, I sat down with Dana just 10 days ago and I says, look, we, this university, you've got to do more here. You've got to start bringing some of that university out into the elementary schools and into the public libraries. And, and you've got a lot of talent there. Here's some ideas. And, and he's very interested in that. And I think we'll see more of that in, in, the, uh, in the near future. Um, it's a great university, but a lot of this stuff goes behind the walls, and there's no reason why some of the talent that they have there couldn't be here. Um, I want to thank again uh, uh, Brian and Diane, and uh, especially Evelyn. What a, she really puts the building blocks together for us. Don't know what I do with them. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. So, in summary, I would propose that the school committee accept this annual gift of $5,000 from the Mel and Paula Shea Charitable Endowment. Is that a recommendation? Yes, Madam Chair, I recommend that uh, you approve this gift. We have a motion. So moved. A second? A second. Motion by Mrs. Layton, second by Dr. Prelandowski. Any discussion? Thank you. Hearing that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted, we would like to have the opportunity to shake your hand, Mr. Shell.
Hoggan come forward to give us a report. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Riley, School Committee, Dr. Forbes, Central Office, audience members, teachers, administrators. Um, I'm happy to be here to give you a little update on what we've done this past school year regarding the standards based report card. Since August, we implemented the report card as a pilot for students in kindergarten through grades four in both Bridgewater and Rainier. And during this time, we've integrated technology as a means to complete the report card and teachers have the option to access their report cards from school or home if they choose to do so, which is a nice uh, piece that we didn't have before, and the technology has been uh, made it easier instead of using those carbon copy report cards. Um, in the fall, I conducted two family nights to inform families about the new pilot report card, and we had a meeting in Rainham and also one in Bridgewater. At this time, we shorted parents that we would be conducting a parent survey to get their feedback on the standards based report card and we also wanted to get the essential feedback from our faculty on what they thought about the, re the uh, report card as they worked their way through it this year. Um, the surveys were developed by a team that, been working, that have been working together since uh, last year and on March 25th, Professional Development Day, the teachers came together from both towns and developed both surveys, one for the parents and one for the staff. Um, the parent guidance, sur parent guidance surveys went home with the April report card, and for first, second, third, and fourth grade students, the kindergarten report cards go home twice a year, so when parents got the report, the survey, they did not have the report card to reference at that time because the report cards go home in January and June. So I'm going to share with you some of the highlights um, overall, we had approximately 528 parent surveys who returned uh, the surveys from both towns, and the surveys consisted of five questions with an option for parents to state any questions, concerns, or comments they had regarding the report cards. Overall, parents rated the standards based report card for the 2010-2011 pilot year with a 56% of responses ranging from very good to excellent. 90% um, of the responses felt the report card was an effective means of reporting the child's progress. And then 59% of parent responses felt that the content area rating scale, scale, which is E for exceeds, M for meets the year end standard, P for progressing, and B for beginning to develop the year end standard, they felt that it was clearly defined. They also felt that the student responsibility rating scale, which consisted of consistently, sometimes, and really was clearly defined as well. There are two different rating scales on the report card, um, one for student responsibilities and one for the academic content area. As far as the parental comments, their main concern was what does P for progressing mean? They felt that it was a little too vague and that they want, as parents, they want to know if the child is progressing at a slow rate, at an adequate rate, are they where they should be, and what does that look like? How can they help their children at school and how will they know if their child is not progressing? at a rate in which they should be. And because of that, um, that was a concern somewhat early on, so we had decided to add what we called canned comments under ELA and math. Because first term, if you get a P in the area, which means they're progressing towards the year in standard, and second term, they got another P in a content area, then um, parents weren't sure how well they were, were doing in that area, progressing at an accurate rate, a moderate rate, or too slowly. So we added what we call the canned comments, so it would add more clarity for parents under the ELA and math section. And the canned comments only allow you to have so many characters or so much spacing. So that's why they were limited more in response, but teachers had the option, second and fourth quarter, they uh, do a narrative as well. And then on the first and second quarter, first and third quarter, they have parent conferences so they have an opportunity to really explain the report card and go over student progress. Um, so that was their major concern. And some of the positive feedback we received on the surveys were they really thought it was a good way to communicate child's progress. They really liked that the report card was showing progress to, towards the year and goal versus hard grades. 
And I like that we are comparing the child to the standard and not to the peers within the classroom. And they like the categories and descriptions and teacher comments and conferences really meant the most to them and their child. As far as the faculty standards-based report card survey, we did have 47 teacher surveys completed as, um, as late as June 10th. Overall, 89% of the teachers rated the standards-based report card in the range of fair to excellent, with 79% agreeing that the report card was effective in communicating progress. But 64% of teachers were not satisfied with the content area rating scale as they agreed with the parents that the P for progressing needs to be made more clear. And 16 of the 47 teachers made suggestions, and the majority of them agreed that the P for progressive is too vague as well. And they would like clarity. And that's something we'll be working on this summer. 55% um, of teachers agreed that the current student responsi responsibility scale 1, 2, and 3 needs to be changed. Um, it was uh, consistently, usually, and, and rarely. I think it was with the 3. And what they're looking for really is one through four, one, two, three, four, because we wanted to put consistently, um, sometimes, consistently, usually, sometimes, really. They prefer those four categories, because as we were going through the report card first term, they really realized that it's not just sometimes or consistently, there is a difference between, and usually needs to be added. So I'm sure that will take place this summer. Um, summary of teacher comments included, we need a better way to distinguish between the higher end and lower end of P progressing rating scale, as I just mentioned. Um, we need to revise some of the canned comments or give more options, and that will depend on space on the report card and in the um, computer system. Uh, change the student responsibility scale to four categories, which I just explained. And there continues to be a need for creating common assessments that are consistent for each grade in each town, which the district is currently working on. And we need to explore the idea of trimesters. This will be discussed over the summer and a recommendation will be made in August of this year. Um, the report cards and the standards have a lot more areas for teachers to report out on. Um, and also, the changes that have been made or will be made. Um, last term, teachers did receive a copy of the actual report card. And that was to verify their grades, what they were getting before that was a printout with all the codes, the student grades, and then I had to cross-reference the codes, the report card, and it was very cumbersome with all the information that was on it. And Jen Doyle was an um, integral part of making sure the technology piece took place and she was able to find a way to make it that the actual report card, the verification forms, was the actual report card they were seeing. So if there were any mistakes on it, the teachers have a couple day windows to make those corrections and the secretaries could print them out in time enough for them to be copied and put in the, um, envelopes to go home. Um, and then we will, we will be changing the social responsibility scale um, from four, from the three ratings to the four ratings. And overall, the teachers love the use of the technology and having consistent report cards across each town, and parents also agreed to that as well in the surveys. The consist consistency in reporting out through each grade level will also be easier for parents to understand from year to year, because now we have report cards that are very similar from each town and each grade. Um, moving forward, I'll be meeting with a core group of teachers for a couple days this July to address the concerns uh, regarding the report cards from the, from the parents' perspective and the teachers. Uh, during these two days, we'll, we will review the surveys. Um, there will be changes made to both rating scales. We will continue to align the standards on the report card to the new Common Core standards that are being implemented. Uh, on March 25th, the Professional Development Day, teachers began some of that work and changing the report card standards in math. Um, we still need to fine tune that and we will be working on the ELA portion of the Common Core that needs to be addressed in the report cards to align to the standards. Uh, the changes for the report card will need to be implemented into our computer system and that will need to take place as soon as possible. And then we need to update and revise any of the pamphlets. Uh, that reflect any changes. We also need to update our staff and administrators and community members of any of the changes on report cards. So we have a lot of work to do um, over the summer and into the fall. Um, 
Before I finish, I'd like to thank all the teachers for putting their best efforts forward and working through this new report card. It is a pilot year, and the majority of them um, volunteered to do it. So thank you very much. I know it wasn't an easy task. It was extensive work behind the scenes by them, so thank you very much. Um, they pulled together to create various assessments um, during the school year. I'd also like to thank Jen Doyle and the tech team, Ken Dubois, Tom Mulcahy, and Tom Tidwell. They did a lot of work uh, training myself and the secretaries and everyone on the technology piece. And in addition, I'd like to thank the secretaries because they had a new role and they had to learn um, how to input classrooms per through the report card process and print them out. And there's a, another whole piece there, a lot of behind the scenes work that took place in the report cards this year. So that is an update of what has happened so far this year and some feedback. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a lot of work has already gone into it. And we're still working on any questions from the community. I would just like to say that this is a major, major initiative and I'm very proud of everyone who's worked on it. The quality of the work is excellent. The way we are reporting progress out to families uh, about their students' progress is has changed completely. It's very thorough, um, and I'm getting positive feedback from this. We need to tweak it now, and we'll go into full implementation in the fall. And I want to thank uh, Mrs. LaCondra and all of the folks involved uh, for pitching in to make this happen. As you heard her say, it involved almost everyone in the process. So thank you to everyone and to our staff for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Thank you, teachers. responsibilities. In addition to running, operating their own buildings, they also have a district-wide curriculum responsibility. And so I'm very pleased uh, to show off their talent and to have them report out. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, committee, Dr. Forbes, audience. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with the math folks this year, and one thing that we uh, learned this year looking at the Common Core, our adjustment to that is we're going to need to do an awful lot of work to make sure all the curriculum pieces, because the shift is going to include trying to bring in things that we normally do as well as add in things that we're going to need to do in the future. So it's going to be a big transition here. Uh, with that in mind, and also with uh, keeping in mind that we are going to adopt or have adopted uh, everyday math for next year, uh, the fact that our Connected Math Project CNP books are rather old. I believe we're into, into the third version of uh, CNP. We still have CNP 1. Uh, that it might be time to look at some other products that are out there that have been uh, developed in the last 10 years. Uh, one product that is out there is what's known as Impact Math. Impact Math was designed specifically to follow everyday math. Uh, it is a standards-based program. It has a constructivist part, but also works with traditional algorithms and uh, was built as a transition program between the everyday math and our traditional high school math programs. Um, so we would like to pilot that next year. Uh, hopefully in uh, two classrooms in grade six in both sides of the district. So four grade six, four grade sevens, four grade eights. Uh, once, uh, if we do have your approval, we'll start lining up the volunteers. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any questions from anyone about the folks? I would ask that you approve this pilot, this mass pilot program. It makes tremendous sense to have a feeder program from our new elementary K through four program into K through five, excuse me, into um, the middle school so that it will transition nicely into high school. And one other thing is that this impact math program will ensure that children are performing algebra in the eighth grade, and we would like to see an expansion into that. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. Do we have a motion for Dr. Fitz's recommendation? Dr. Fitz, second. Second. Mrs. Layton, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. A consolidated program review update, Dr. Forbes. Yes. Um, we have uh, completed uh, uh, participating in a consolidated program review, and Mrs. Paolini is going to explain what that is and how we did on that. 
Thank you, good evening. In your packet, you should have a pamphlet that has the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's about four pages, and I'm gonna to refer to that a little bit in a minute. Just to, a quick overview for everybody or for people who aren't familiar with the coordinated program process. Um, as part of the accountability system of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they send out periodically um, individuals to make sure that the school districts are in compliance with state education requirements. The coordinated program review per se re covers three areas, the special education area, civil rights, and also English language learners. And each school district is scheduled for a CPR review every six years. And there's also a mid-cycle review of special education as a follow-up in three years after the CPR review. So we had a review team come out to the district in December, and it's on there December 6th through December 10th. And what the members did is they reviewed many, many components of our district regarding civil rights, special education, and English learners. And what they did is they wanted to determine in many, many ways, are we up to snuff, if you will, with our regulations? They had, we had interviews, they interviewed nine of our administrators, 40 instructional and support staff across all grade levels. They had interviews with two parent representatives, there was also sent out a sample of to um, over 50 parents of students with disabilities a survey. They surveyed 10 parents of English language learners. They also did a, a random sample of our records. They looked at 41 special education student records, 10 English language learner records, and then they reviewed all of our individual school handbooks. In addition, during those days that they were here, the team went to 19 classrooms, and they were not there to observe the specific teachers or their teaching abilities, but they were there to determine if the facilities that we had were being used appropriately in the delivery of the programs and services. After the, review, after the team leaves, they create a review, and they produce a document and it's a report which the district received from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and it contains ratings for all the criterions that were reviewed, and also a finding for each of the criterions. As you look in the, pam in the pamphlet that I gave you, if you would go over to the third page, what you'll see is the scope of the program reviews, as I said, they talk about special education, civil rights, English language learners. Uh, the career and vocational education did not apply to us. And they talk about the legalities and the reviews. On the following page, what you're going to see is a summary of the criterion areas that they reviewed. And also, they will tell us whether they felt that we partially implemented, did not implement, or there were other criteria that were requiring responses. And there were also criteria where there, the option was that we could be commended upon them. And the last page simply gives you the basics of what each of them means. Now, if you look at special education, civil rights, ELL, for example, they say SE8, SE9, CR3. We were fortunate we did not re receive any that were not implemented. We were commended on one, and Mr. Moshe is going to talk a little bit about that one. The majority of ours were partially lim implemented, which, sim which simply means that the requirement in one or more aspects was not entirely met. And quite a few of them, it was simple language changes. It was not that we were not doing anything properly. In some of them, it was the omission of perhaps one or two words in a handbook. So those are easily corrected. So what happens when we have criteria that are that are found to be only partially implemented, we have to propose a corrective action plan to bring those areas into compliance. And we have a due date and we have to produce a corrective action plan. 
what we are doing in special education regarding the civil rights and the English language learners. We're developing a corrective action plan which is going to be submitted by June 28th of this year to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And what will happen is they will either approve or disapprove or make comments on our corrective action plan. And once we receive that, which I would guess would be within approximately a month or so, we'll be able to report further to the committee about what the Department of Ed thought about our corrective action plan. But what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to have Mr. Moshe just talk a little bit about the special ed aspect and particularly the areas we were commended upon. Good evening, thank you. Um, the on-site team that did come down was a panel of three people. They did come down and they made specific um, commendations to the school district in regards to our least restrictive environment um, settings. In particular, in the area that they made specific mention of is um, the Bridgewater Radium Regional School District in the Reeds Collaborative Program, or the Daphne Town Hearing Program, are commended for the efforts in ensuring that students in the program for the deaf and hard of hearing are welcome into the schools and are educated in the least restrictive setting. Students in the program, from preschool through high school, have opportunities for inclusion and attend general education classes with interpreters as appropriate. Staff from Reed's Collaborative work closely with the staff from the district to arrange for inclusion classes that meet each student's programmatic needs. Students also participate in school-wide assemblies, school activities, and extracurricular activities and programs. Um, in particular, they did mention that um, at the Williams Intermediate School, you know, that particular school that was witnessed by the members of the panel, that they utilized a um, sign of the day. Um, and that happened to be one of the schools that they did witness this. And then in particular mentioned that, you know, the sign of the day, those you know, students were observed approaching students from that particular REACH program to learn what that sign of the day is. And if, for example, if there was and I'll say that the sign of the day is sunny. You know, the students from the Williams would run around and find students of that particular program and then learn the sign for the word sunny. Um, and they, they absolutely love that. Um, and as Ms. Paley said, right now we're in the process of, of reviewing their report, developing a corrective action plan, and then implementing it, and then following through with that and, and showing the data and documentation to support that. Are there any questions from the committee for us? I have every confidence that uh, our team will put together a comprehensive corrective action plan and that the state will approve it and we will have everything fully in the Okay, next um, administrative and school committee reports, fiscal year 2011 budget update, Lisa Cito. Um, I believe in your packets you have a copy of the uh, budget report, and this is uh, a report that's coming to you with the latest information. Uh, it includes our June 16th payroll, which is tomorrow's payroll. Uh, this month in June, we have actually four payrolls uh, that occur. Uh, our next payroll will be a lump sum payroll for teachers. And then we'll have a third warrant and accounts payable uh, warrant happening on June 30th. So we still have a little bit of ways to go uh, to end out our fiscal year. Um, well, most of the funds here are um, that we still need to pay uh, for fiscal year 11 have been set aside. We have them in the forms of encumbrances. There are still a number of things that are not encumbered in this budget report that will be coming forward uh, that will realize the expenses as we finish out the year. For instance, items such as reimbursements uh, for travel or course reimbursements. Um, these will be happening over the next few weeks and on into July uh, for the first payroll in July and uh, vendor accounts payable in July. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out is that we have sent notifications out to all staff through email, urging everyone to bring in any unpaid timesheets. This is a critical time of year for us. As we're trying to get our bottom line squared away, we need to make sure that we have every um, 
payment in so that we can get it either paid by June 30th or set aside those funds and carry those funds over for the next fiscal year. What occurs is many times, as you'll see a little later in the agenda, uh, something comes in after the close of the school year and if funds are not carried forward, then we have to come back to the school committee to seek approval, which just delays the whole process of getting the payments made timely. Um, also in this um, memo that we sent out, we also wanted to stress to folks who may be taking courses during July and August, and who will be getting paid out of fiscal year 11 funds to let us know ahead of time if you're doing that if we don't already have that information. Uh, you don't have to get all your paperwork in, obviously. You won't have it because you'll have to take the courses first. But what we'll do is, as long as you know what the cost of the tuition is, we'll encumber those funds and set them aside so that once all of your paperwork is in, you've completed the course, we'll be able to expedite that payment for you. We won't have to prolong that. So if you would please do that, I just wanted to make mention of that for everyone. Tomorrow, um, we're gonna be having our uh, trainer from Budget Sense uh, come in and help us figure out the process for the closing of the fiscal year um, and also for the opening of the new fiscal year. So we're going to be a little bit busy <laughs> trying to get those processes all figured out and in place so that uh, within the next few weeks we'll be able to make all of those changes that need to occur. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about the budget report. We're looking in good shape. Um, and as I said, there's still a number of things that aren't reflective here, but will be occurring over the next few weeks. Thank you, Ms. McKeon. Any questions from any members of the committee? Seeing none, Dr. Forbes, any comments? No, I think we're coming in uh, fine. The budget will be, uh, uh, hopefully, the black. Oh, it will be the black. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. Uh, under uh, Ms. Macedo's uh, fine watch, it's very detailed. If anyone has any questions, please direct them uh, to Ms. Macedo through my office, and we'll be happy to provide any answers to you. Thank you. And next, I think, Ms. Macedo, you also have yeah. a food services update? Yes. I also believe in your packet there is a memo from um, me through the superintendent uh, regarding our upcoming contract with our food service company, Chartwells. Um, as you recall, we have a five-year contract. Uh, it's actually one year with uh, four one-year renewals. And we're in the third or fourth year of the contract in 2012. Um, and as part of that contract, we had had, uh, if you go on a few pages here, you'll see a copy of the um, pricing, the vendor response sheet that showed um, under section C that in fiscal year 2012, we would increase our uh, meal prices from 225 at the elementary and middle school levels to 250, and at the high school from 250 to 275. Now, as part of this contract, there is a break-even clause, and the company guarantees that as long as we follow this budget that they've proposed um, and these meal prices that if for some reason they should not make a profit, they will cover those expenses. We wouldn't have to take that out of our budget. So we've got a guarantee there of not having our food service um, uh, program affect our budget, our operational budget. I also have in the packet a, a copy of comparison of current uh, area school districts and their prices. Um, and you can see some of them are in, already up in those areas of 275 and 250, some aren't. Uh, some may be more heavily free and reduced lunch, so maybe that's why they're able to keep their daily price down. But uh, some new guidelines have been coming out from the USDA, and what they're doing is they're mandating uh, that school food authorities must provide the same level of support for lunches served to students who are not eligible for free and reduced price lunches as they do for those students who are. So what they're saying is right now we have to charge at least a minimum of $2.46 uh, per meal uh, to meet that guideline and thereafter we'd have to continue to increase that as 
their guidelines go up. So every year we could have to be increasing by a nickel, a dime, or whatever the amount may be. So um, at this time, I would recommend that we just um, do the 25 cent. Uh, then we wouldn't have to go up in the final year of the contract. We'd be all set then. And we wouldn't constantly be coming back for increases. I recommend uh, that you go with the pricing structure that Ms. Mazzito has set forth, uh, knowing that the federal requirement is going to be $2.46. Do we have a motion to approve the recommendation from the superintendent? So moved. Um, Doug Pinky second. Uh, the motion made by Mrs. Layton. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. And do you have another request for us? Yes, yes, I'm busy today. <laughs> uh, trying to catch up with the end of the year here. Um, we have uh, in the packet a request uh, for payment from E&D uh, for reimbursement to a former employee for an overpayment of health insurance premiums that we need to reimburse back to um, the former employee. The amount is $3,387.30. And we have a calculation attached um, that will help explain that a little further. Thank you, Ms. Macedo. Dr. Forbes? I recommend that uh, the committee vote to approve the transfer from e &D. Based on Dr. Forbes' recommendation and motion. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Macedo, second. Dr. Pudowski, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. One more, Ms. Macedo? Yes, I believe so. And I hope it's in your packet. Um, does everyone have the payroll and warrant scheduled for fiscal year 2012? Uh, what we've been doing uh, since we switched to the bi-weekly schedule um, is have a copy of the dates uh, for both payroll and vendor or accounts payable warrants um, approved so that everyone's aware of you know, when teachers come back, uh, when is their first paycheck, um, or what week is you know the warrant week. Uh, so before you, you have next year's schedule starting, I believe, with July 14th as the first uh, warrant uh, of the year and going through to the end of the year again with different dates in June um, as teachers leave. Thank you. Okay, next we're moving along here. We have a vote on the reads agreement, Dr. Forbes. Yes, uh, it has come to our attention through legal counsel that we need to have a school committee vote on the uh, Reed's Collaborative Agreement. There are two changes to the agreement. First is the change in the, num the list of member communities. Uh, the board voted to accept uh, Freetown and Lakeville, uh, <coughs> Freetown, I'm sorry, Freetown, Lakeville Regional. And the second change is in the purpose of the collaborative listed on page one of the agreement that will allow Reed's Collaborative to have to receive a tax exempt number through the IRS. Our legal counsel suggests that we vote to approve this. Okay. Based on that recommendation, do we have a motion? So Dr. Lewandowski second, Dr. Casey, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Update and recommendations on fiscal year 2012 school budget, Mrs. Layton. I have an update, I don't know if I have any recommendations. <laughs> um, the last meeting we talked about the fact that Rainham had approved at town meeting the um, assessment and I can also inform you that this month, earlier this month, the town council for Bridgewater finally approved their budget after many long meetings. They finally approved their budget and they uh, approved our assessment. So both member communities. <laughs> supporting our assessments and I probably could say that this is the earliest we've Ooh. known that from both member communities in quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> I can say um, 
the clear message from both communities continues to be, however, that we need to continue to look at our fixed costs and we keep that in mind as we move forward. But we are very thankful to both communities. Thank you, and thank you very much, Mrs. Layton, for all of your hours of attending meetings representing us. We greatly appreciate it. Okay, unfinished business, school committee policy, second reading, student activity account, and social networking policy. Dr. Pirandowski. All right, we'll do the student activity account first. And basically, um, this is just guidelines for tallying and keeping track of the student activity account. And this is the second reading, but we would like to add uh, just an introduction into the policy, the, the following sentences, that the student activity funds are funds that may be raised by students to finance the activities of authorized student organizations. Student activity funds are considered a part of the total fiscal operation of the district and are subject to policies established by the school committee and the office of the superintendent. The funds are governed by Mass General Law Chapter 66 of the Acts of 1996 and shall be managed in accordance with sound business practices, which will include accepted budgetary and accounting practices. And we're going to add that to the policy. To the beginning. To the beginning. And that will be the only change in this second reading. <coughs> So we're looking for a vote to approve? Yeah. Uh, do we have that as the motion, Dr. Pirinowski? So moved. Second? Second. 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 We, we need two votes, right? One for the amendment and then one vote for the Well, we're not, this is, this is, do we? Well, because we're not, we're, this is second reading. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that we had the first reading, we're able to come back, right. make any changes, and now, can vote on it, right? Right. So, so, so it's a total package. Well, it won't hurt to take both. So a vote then, um, motion on the amendment, Dr. Lewandowski, no. second, Dr. Um, Casey with, anyway. <laughs> any, any, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and now on the cool. policy cool. itself, full cool policy. And it's a motion by Dr. Pirandowski, second by Dr. Casey. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And our social networking policy, uh, this is also a second reading and it's very simple. All electronic communication between school personnel and students, including email, web posting, and social networks will be appropriate, professional, and for educational purposes only. So that's a motion to approve, Dr. Pirinowski. So, Second by Mrs. Layton. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Um, and next, we come to the business approval of student handbooks for 2011-2012. Same here, Dr. Forbes. Yes, I'd like to begin by asking our high school principal. Okay. She, she stepped out, so she'll be back. So what I will do is switch the order, okay. and I will ask that we begin with our middle school, um, Lynn Bastoni, the Bridgewater Middle School Student Handbook Changes. If you would come up, Ms. Bastoni, and uh, review those highlights with us. Changes are very minor this year. Uh, one thing we do want to include are is back, language for backpacks, and we're doing that in line with the Rainham Middle School. Mr. Forrest and I have been working with each other, and we're trying to get our language similar, so we'll both have the same language under backpacks. Um, we're going to add language under swearing that includes um, swearing or the use of inappropriate language that is severely degrading, humiliating, or embarrassing to another. <laughs> that is in addition to what we have in there already. Um, we will allow for changes regarding district contacts. Um, we would like to include the new district-wide language on bullying. Um, we would also like to include the district-wide changes to the language under attendance, district-wide language of notice of non-discrimination, and a Please allow for changes in the dates to reflect the 2011-2012 school year. And we would change the language according to the district um, language for discipline of students with disabilities. And there's also some new language for discipline of students with disabilities under Section 504. So we would like to make those changes for the 2011-2012 school year. Thank you, Ms. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> In an effort to uh, continue to provide the safest school environment possible for our students, um, I would like to uh, make a couple of recommendations uh, that's in addition to the normal adjusting dates and positional changes um, of our Rainy Middle School handbook. Also, I would like to thank Mrs. Bestoni from Middle. Middle. Um, these changes are a result of a collaborative, collaborative effort with uh, Lynn, and I'm greatly appreciative of her input. Um, as Lynn just said a moment ago, the first change will be uh, not in the book, it is page 36, but under the uh, topic of swearing at the end of what we already have in there existing, what I'd like to do is add, as Lynn just said, again, the use of extreme inappropriate language that is severely degrading, humiliating, or embarrassing to a student will, will receive a suspension up to a maximum of three days. Also, under the uh, topic of uh, backpacks, um, we would like to add on the first line where it says all book bags, we would like to insert tote bags and backpacks must remain. So basically to that line, it's, it's basically just adding in tote bags. Um, if you'd like to add in Mr. Swenson's man bag, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so. um, those are all the changes. Thank you very much. Very important, it is the end of the first and the Bruins are up one nothing. we were just told. Just an update. Um, the recommendations that the high school is proposing to make for the student handbook are as follows. I'll just touch briefly upon the big ones. Uh, we are looking to clarify the wording under tardiness to school regarding our social probation. It's very, um, it's very brief right now. We wanted to kind of put step by step so parents really understood the process. So we, we wrote that out. 
Under the National Honor Society, we are seeking to change the GPA from a 3.75 to a 4.0. Um, and I'd like to, if I can take a moment, if it's okay with the committee, just talk about that for a few minutes because I do think it, it does deserve some, some justification, some verification, some, some clarity. Um, back in 2008, 2009, the high school implemented a change to its course leveling system. In response to the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, which is NEASC, they cited a, our S2 level courses as lacking evidence of intellectually, intellectually challenging content. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, which is the NCAA Clearinghouse, which dictates um, academics to all of our Division I and Division II athletes, stated that our S2 courses have a below average grading scale. We are therefore denying the S2 level. They deem them unacceptable at the collegiate acceptance level for athletics. It was decided at that time to eliminate the S2 level to ensure that all BR students were afforded a robust learning opportunities across the board. In doing so, the great interpretation chart that actually Mr. Wyman saved me by um, passing that out, I too also have a copy of that to um, give to you a little bit blown up. It was altered. On a side note, it's also important to understand that back, back in the day when we first started offering AP, or Advanced Placement Courses, college-bearing courses, we only offered three. We currently have eight. And not next school year, but the school year after, I'll be coming to you because we're going to propose to increase it by two more and have a total of 10. And what's important, and why that's important to understand is that if a student gets a grade of an A, not an A+, plus, just an A, that weighs 5, 5.0. We don't have a typical 4.0 scale. Um, so all of these things impacted the GPA. Now, no one knows for sure the true impact that any change is going to have until you play it out a little and then you start analyzing the data. You can all make hypothetical um, hypotheses, but it's been enough time now that we can look back at a two-year trend. And in terms of GPAs, this is what we've seen. Prior to the level change, it was always about an approximation between, I'd say, 13 and 15 percent of the students that met the criteria, the outstanding criteria for academic achievement for eligibility into the National Honor Society. And I'm not sure if the committee has those percentages. Um, hold on one second. I have them. Thank you, Ms. Macedo. Just quickly, if you look at the percentages of eligible students that are getting inducted into the National Honor Society from some local schools in the area, Brockton has 3%. That's 3% of the students that are eligible get into the National Honor Society. Sharon has 7%, Silver Lake has 10, Mansfield has 13%, West Bridgewater has 16%, Taunton has 17%, and Bridgewater Regional High School has 23%. The average, if you take the two outliers out of that, is around 13% for local schools. The student officers of the National Honor Society expressed their concern to the faculty council over the ever-growing number of inductees. They never came with a percent, they just stated that a lot of kids, a lot more kids seem to be making the cut to get into the NHS. They stated that the GPA, in their opinion, was too low. They made accurate claims, um, they backed up their claims. They felt that the NHS no longer had the same, I'm going to use the word, clout as it used to, didn't carry the same, didn't have the same impact, the same meaning. One of the officers recently stated, they said it was a joke of the school, that it really wasn't an honor if just about the whole grade could make it. Now that's a bit of an exaggeration, but 23% is roughly a one to four ratio. They then, the students, the officers, following their constitutional bylaws that govern the National Honor Society, went to the student members for a vote. The vote was almost unanimous to raise the GPA from a 3.75 to a 4.0. Now there's a couple of things that, that people do need to understand in terms of clarifying this. According to the National Honor Society Constitution, the Faculty Council will develop, revise when necessary, all chapter procedures for selection. Revisions may be made by the officers, those are students. Majority vote by members, those are students. Present will allow for amendments, it's their constitution. You might not agree with the Constitution, but that's the National Honor Society Constitution. Local chapters 
may raise the cumulative GPA standard above the national minimum, which as stated earlier is a 3.0 based on a 4.0 scale. We don't have a 4.0 scale. If you look at the grade interpretation chart, our scale is based at a 5.3. So because we have a 5.3 scale, to kind of put this in perspective, and I'm sorry to do math with you at 9 o'clock at night, but in an accelerated class, if a student attained a 3.0, some may seem to think, well, that's great. That's a 3.0. That's outstanding. In actuality, it's a C plus. A C plus is average. It's not outstanding. So I think it does, I think it is important to kind of take a look at the grade interpretation chart. Just in case, blown up version if you want it a little bit bigger. I know it's a little tough to read. Okay, as you can see, in the advanced placement course, or the AP course, it's a course that carries college credit, the current 3.75 GPA equates to a B minus. That's below the national minimum standard set by the Constitution of the NHS, which is a, a B. In an accelerated class, a 3.75 equates to a B or a B plus. It's right in between. In terms of numbers, that would be approximately an 85. And an 85 is the minimum standard that the NHS sets. So members of the committee, BR in actuality is at the minimum requirement. It might not seem that way because most people think of a 3.75 based on a 4.0 scale. Our scale in actuality is much higher. The proposed change from a 3.75 to a 4.0 really kind of boils down to this. In an AP course, a 4.0 is a B. It would allow us to meet the national minimum criteria set by the NHS. In an accelerated course, a 4.0 would equate to, in between a B, a B plus and an A minus, call it an 89. We also on the side took a look at what would happen if we just did away with GPA. And just for playing with numbers, what would it look like if we decided just to take the top 15% of the class? What would that look like? If we took the top 15% of this year's class and said, okay, what, how many kids would make the cut and what would the lowest GPA be? The lowest GPA in that cut was a 3.937. So no matter how we've looked at it, we've tried to look at it many different angles, um, it keeps kind of coming back to the same circle that it's landing us back at our equivalence of a 4.0 GPA based on the 5.3 scale. Please know that by no means are we trying to exclude deserving students. This is a prestigious, prestigious organization to belong to. I hold it in the utmost regards. Um, but when your students are kind of walking around school or telling their parents or talking to each other and saying it's kind of a joke, then there's no more enthusiasm there. There's no more excitement when almost one out of four students can, can make the cut to get in. We do pride ourselves. BR prides itself, its teachers, its students for commending them on their academic success. We take a great deal of pride in that. Um, their success is our success. We wouldn't have it without them. But we have lots of other things that we do acknowledge the students with. Best of the bunch, we have the academic awards night, we have scholarship night, we have the principals club, um, and that's just a couple of them. But the NHS is supposed to represent the top echelon of everything. It's, for me, it's the star that all students have to strive to achieve. Increasing the GPA from a 3.75 to a 4.0 is mathematically the equivalent of going from a B to a B plus. In numbers, it, goes, it takes us from an 85 to an 88. And that's the proposed change for the GPA. If you want to wait for the questions and I can go through the rest of the handbook changes, or do you, I can, I can take any questions if you, you have now. No, why don't you go through the whole presentation? Okay, moving on with some of the proposed changes for the high school handbook. Under the personal responsibility statement, we're going to go back with confiscated equipment. In terms of electronic devices, um, we're going to change the wording to state that they will be confiscated by a staff member and that it will only be returned to a parent or legal guardian after the school day has ended and we're going to give them a time period from between 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. to pick up the confiscated equipment. 
under the dress code. Currently it reads brief or revealing clothing is not acceptable. We're going to um, get that a little bit more explicit and give examples to students because it, it always seems to be a debate as to what we think is brief or revealing and what they think is brief or revealing. So we're going to actually include certain things, spaghetti strap tops, muscle shirts, halter tops, bare midriff, tube tops, one shoulder shirts are unacceptable. Tops should be a minimum of one inch wide at the shoulders um, and undergarments of any kind should be entirely out of view. Unfortunately, we do have to put that in there. Um, sounds a little crazy. The biggest change overall that we really made to the handbook, and I have to give the committee a, um, a lot of credit here, a lot of time and effort went into this, Mr. Siciliano ran the committee, is they took the code of conduct, and if you look at it now, it's just listed 50 something different offenses, um, and they put them into categories. There's four categories, A, B, C, and D. If you just take a look at part A, these are, what, these are your most serious offenses. Alcohol, drugs, weapons, assaults. And then it gives you the consequence and it gives you the additional action. So it gives us as administrators a little bit of flexibility. Group B is a little bit less extreme. It carries less of a penalty. Likewise, group C and then group D. At the beginning of this, we get the caveat of, it does not mean that these are any and all. It just, these are just examples of kind of gives us something to, to go by a little bit easier. Um, under the discipline and special education students, we're gonna update that based on the most recent compliance review by the Department of Ed that Mrs. Paolini and Mr. Moser spoke about. <clears throat> we are going to add a photography statement, which is an entirely new statement that um, just informs parents that periodically throughout the school year, their child might be interviewed or photographed by the newspaper and at any time, obviously, if they do not want that to happen, then they can contact the school and we, we can note that in the computer. We are going to start providing class rank and GPAs to students much earlier. Um, the GPA and the class rank will be calculated the beginning of a student's sophomore year. So after they've completed their freshman year, when they come back sophomore year, they're gonna get their GPA. Then we're also gonna do it at the beginning of their junior year and the middle of their junior year. And then we're gonna do it at the beginning of their senior year, the middle of their senior year, and the end of third term. End of third term is probably as accurate as we can get it at that point in time for seniors. Uh, we just don't have enough time at the very end of the school year to recalculate it. It's too close to graduation. Under bullying and harassment, we're gonna put in all the updated verbiage from the, from the district-wide plan to make sure that we are in compliance with that. Additions to the athletic and parental policy regulation for the code of conduct. We are going, just to put in a statement that we are in compliance with the Massachusetts general laws govern, governing the safety regulations for school athletic programs. We're gonna put in a section where parents can write in the dates of, of a concussion and the dates of medical clearance to return to the activity. And the last addition, I'm not sure if it's in your packet or not, is we are making a proposal that community service become a graduation requirement. And we are seeking to roll this out so we're not going to do it across the board all four years next year. Next year's incoming freshmen would be required to complete 15 hours of community service. Each year it would be 15 hours, so it would culminate at 60 hours. 60 hours would then become the graduation requirement, so I believe the incoming class, they are the graduating class of 2015, so they would be the first graduating class to have a 60 hour requirement. We are actually, our committee's still meeting, we're in the process of creating a guidebook, um, but that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it, that it would be 15 hours per year, 60, 60 hours at the end. And I believe that is all. Thank you, Ms. Watson. I particularly appreciate that community service component, as you know. We've talked about that before. And our subcommittee on volunteerism and community service would be very happy to meet with your committee as well and, and try to assist in that. That would be perfect. One of my committee members, Barbara Norman, is here tonight, so that, that would be excellent. We would love that. <laughs> relative to the National Honor Society and taking into consideration um, Ms. Watson's report and the um, concerns expressed by um, Mr. Wyman as a concerned parent and member of the community, would it be appropriate to approve the handbook and hold on the National Honor Society changes and have the report back with the board? 
Warren Commission on that? Yes, that would be fine. And that wouldn't create any problems for the no, no. I would just like to have um, a report back to the committee prior to the start of the school year. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions or comments from me? I have one question through you, Madam Chair. If you did change the National Honor Society, you'd do it so that anybody in the program would continue. It already be grandfathered in, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Recommendation. My recommendation to the school committee is that you approve the changes to the high school student handbook. With the exception, with the with the exception the of the National Honor Society. With the report to come prior to the next school year. Okay, a motion? So moved. Don't approve without a second. Second. Um, Mrs. Layton, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude the student handbooks? Well, we have a few more schools yet. We have a few more schools, but I think they're all coming tonight. Oh, they're all here. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Lynch to come forward, please, and uh, share the uh, Mitchell Elementary School handbook change. Good evening again. I uh, will feature at the Mitchell Elementary School. Uh, we will make all the necessary changes with local policy, with national and state law. We will update the bullying policy uh, to reflect changes at our school level. Uh, one of the suggestions that came out of the school council is that we find a centralized place for our quote, bully box, unquote. And uh, we're gonna do that, I believe. But there'll also be some featured items at our school that will change for next year, including a program that the Gemsport organization has put in place this year called Road to Kindergarten, which is an excellent program of transitioning those students from, uh, from life into school. <laughs> and uh, it's a great program, and Christine Smith is our new Gemsport president, has been doing a lot of work on that over the course of the year. And uh, the, one of the groups, they, we did a school stroll last week where we had over 100 families come into the school, and, walk through the school and get an introduction to the school, which is excellent. This class, Bridgewater Radium Regional High School, class of 2024, they have t-shirts called Road to Kindergarten, and they'll be in the 4th of July parade. So I think they've sold almost 100 t-shirts for that, so I think that little group, you'll have quite a collection of little five-year-olds in the, in the 4th of July parade. So we're gonna feature the Road to Kindergarten program. We're gonna have a paragraph about the standards-based report card to help parents understand. We're going to talk about the, uh, our art and music program, which uh, parents sometimes don't realize that the children in our school have art and music every other week. Uh, we're gonna talk about MCAS, we're gonna talk about uh, the new Common Core and how we're gonna transition into those standards. So there are things just particularly germane to our school that are gonna be featured in our handbook as noted uh, in the handbook uh, memo, but uh, the, the transition to the Connect Ed program which may be confusing to folks as we transfer from instant alert. So there are a number of changes in addition to basic regular changes, policy changes, and things such as that that are, are particular to our schools, so. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Dr. Forbes, recommendation? Yeah. Yes, my recommendation is that the school committee approve the changes to the George H. Mitchell Elementary School handbook. Motion to approve. So moved. Mrs. Second. Layton, second. Dr. Pewandowski, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Dr. Yes, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Gray, principal of the Liberty Elementary School, to come forward, please. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Forbes. Uh, we just have several changes to our handbook for next year, your usual names and dates. On page five, the information related to Instant Alert will now be aligned with the new communication system, Connect Ed. On page seven under Locker, Personal Belongings, we'd like to add the following list to the list of items not to be brought to school, and it would read cell phones and all other electronic devices. Um, page 34, our bullying policy, like everyone else, will be updated to align with the district policy. Uh, we will also be adding an additional section entitled Discipline of Students with Disabilities, which will also be added in align with the district policy. And um, 
we will now change the price of lunch <laughs> in our handbook as well. Those are the proposed changes for Law Liberty. Thank you, Mr. Gray. That's yours. I recommend that the committee vote to approve the handbook changes for the Law Liberty Elementary School. We have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Gray. Second. 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 Second.
and we detail those in the school improvement plan. We're also going to continue uh, sponsoring and fostering the base kindergarten wraparound program, the base program, and the after school enrichment program. We have an after school foreign language program, uh, which has been successful. We're going to continue to, to work on that. We're going to work on our social competency program, which uh, we're going to continue to try to expand in the future. Uh, we have some things in, in the school that have been, have been uh, started again in the recent three years, and I would credit Mrs. Latenda with her work on the child study team, which is a pre-referral team, and uh, the school-wide reading incentive program. She and a committee of about 16 teachers over the last three years have done wonderful things with that. So we're going to also explore some grant writing with the college, try to work with them, and try to come up with some, some ways that we can bring some additional monies. We're going to try to develop a plan for implementing or, or establishing a new preschool playground on the grounds of the Mitchell Elementary School. We have the district-wide preschool at our school now. I'm going to try that. committee has, has committed to working with uh, those playgrounds, working with our current playgrounds, and trying to keep, make our playgrounds more handicapped accessible. So we're going to continue to those. We're looking at our, our long-range facility plan in terms of what we could do to improve life for our students at the Mitchell Elementary School. And again, goal number one is to improve student achievement. But we have to make it a fun place to learn. We have to make it a nurturing place. And uh, we will hopefully do that inclusive in this plan. Thank you. Mr. Gray is hoping I'll speak a while so he, he can just ditto Mr. Lynch and me. <laughs> right, Mr. Gray? Um, we have three goals, but before I begin, I'd like to thank our, our parent representatives. We had a parent who served uh, this year for the third year in a row. I think she deserves an award. Another parent who served her and volunteered and got elected for her second year. And we had a, a gentleman who uh, was dad of twin girls who was a delight. Uh, and I'd like to thank our two staff members, Mary Jean Chaka and Taryn Riley, who were a delight to work with. Our first goal is to continue to align, construct, and implement curriculum and assessment. And under that goal, we need to create a data team to look at what we're doing, what our assessments are telling us, and how it will help us with our instruction. Uh, as every other school, we will be working with the new Common Core, which incorporates the, uh, I'm sorry, the new mass frameworks incorporating the Common Core, and uh, looking at what we need to do in that area. We have a very active child study team, and um, we hope to continue to follow those established procedures. We are continuing to build uh, nonfiction libraries, both in the classrooms and in our library. Uh, I already mentioned that we're looking into, we'd like to establish a model that could incorporate the Great Books method of shared inquiry into the story town, particularly the higher level materials, reading materials. Um, we are thrilled to be, we piloted Everyday Math this past year, and we'll be thrilled to use it throughout the building next year. As Brian said, we need to continue to train our teachers in uh, social competency, for instance, Open Circle, our responsive classroom. Our goal number two is to continue to communicate with the parents and the general community to maintain support for the school. One of the things the um, school council did think, and by the way, we met eight times uh, from October on, that we would continue to publish and post a monthly newsletter. However, it was suggested that we not send hard copies, to have hard copies available at the office for those who ask, but to continue to post the calendar and newsletter on the school website. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, a couple of our staff members at Everyday Math Training did speak to the consultant, and we're hoping through the um, help with Donna Paolini to have a fall math night with families in the Everyday Math program. That looks like it's a go for early in the school year, probably October. Uh, looking at the data, we know that we have a little bit of work to do or can do with writing in the story town. We find that our language and reading scores are excellent. However, our writing scores are good. 
So we want to do what we can to improve those scores. And the last goal is to continue to improve safety procedures um, to practice our drills uh, called the crisis team, uh, participate in the district-wide safety uh, committee. Uh, we do have a bully box in the front office. I did have her, um, a note in there today for me. It's a very pretty little, you'd never know it's a bully box. It's a very pretty pink hat box and it's called Tell Mrs. Tripp. It's on the front counter. It can, it's anonymous, even though it's on the front counter, it's down below, so you could just walk by and put something in. I'm hoping the teachers don't. Um, <laughs> but it's called Tell Mrs. Tripp. And uh, one of the other things we need to do is we have a beautiful garden out in front of the school and we need to improve the lighting in that garden, um, in, in the front area of the school. And I'm kind of copying Mr. Gray because uh, good ideas should be copied. And uh, he has a beautiful USA map uh, painted on his playground. So guess what we're getting in September? <laughs> Same thing at Merrill. Um, so with that, we have a nice plan for next year. Thank you, Mrs. Chet. Uh, Dr. Cook's recommendation. Yes, I recommend that the school committee approve the um, Lily B. Merrill Elementary School Improvement Plan. We have a motion by Mr. Bagnacica, second by Chief Pacheco. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you, Mrs. Chet. Mr. Chet. Mr. Ditto, Mrs. Tripp and Mr. Lynch, except for the map, since I already had it first. Um, I'll just highlight, you have the formal plan in front of you, I'll just highlight a couple of points. Under improving student achievement, um, as has been mentioned, we are looking forward to implementing everyday math and having training for staff over the summer. We'll also be hosting a family math night at some point in the fall to introduce the program to parents. We will be creating a monthly reading incentive program at La Liberty next year. We will making sure that we work hard to align all the curriculum grades two to four with the new Common Core standards. And we will continue, as Mr. Lynch said, pending funding the after school foreign language program and the read about program. Under um, student citizenship, I just want to highlight that we will continue again to have our monthly citizenship award next year for students to promote and encourage positive behavior. We will continue stating our morning pledge every morning to foster and promote positive citizenship. We'll also be implementing anti-bullying lessons at each grade level that will be instructed by the classroom teacher and PE teachers. And our school resource officer, Lou Pacheco, will be conducting anti-bullying lessons and citizenship building lessons in all our grade four classrooms for next year. Um, and I also wanted to thank the members of my school council before I end. Our two parents on the council were Carrie Lewis Ray and Christine Nelson. Uh, school resource officer Lou Pacheco was our community rep, and Julie Lyon was our teacher rep. So I just wanted to thank them for their service this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Dr. Forbes, I would ask that the school committee vote to approve the school improvement plan for the 
the uh, implementation of additional social studies materials in grades four and five, and that would require a little bit of staff training and um, adding even more resources as necessary, particularly to the library. Uh, the implementation of grade five and six ELA anthology, and that again, staff training and supplemental resources as necessary. Under uh, safe and appropriate facilities, provide students and staff, and that's on page three, provide students and staff with a safe learning environment that is free from bullying and cyberbullying, and that is um, requiring us to uh, continue with our school-wide and parent educational programs, the anti-bullying themes into content areas, a student education um, on the student education on the district policy, and posting of anti-bullying visuals, anti-bullying task force, and additional staff training. Under channels of communication on page four, we would like to invite community members into the classrooms to speak with and read to students. And in technology, um, we would like to increase the opportunities for our students at all grade levels to have um, computer classes, and that would mean the addition of a third computer lab at our building. And that is Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off talking a little bit about student achievement, a few things we're going to be doing in that area. Uh, we're going to be piloting uh, the Galileo online software, which uh, was, uh, was approved last week, I mean, uh, last meeting, and that's in grade seven and eight, uh, and that allows us to uh, set batch benchmarks and, uh, and measure our students on an ongoing basis. We are also going to continue our quarterly assessments. Uh, those are benchmark exams that we use at Rainer Middle School. We use that data to inform our instruction and student progress throughout the year. And of course, we will again develop an MCAS improvement plan once we have our student results this, this fall. Uh, in the area of bullying, we continue our, our bullying efforts, partnering with the Student Council uh, and our faculty uh, committee as well to make sure we are bringing in uh, the right uh, contests and events to promote a positive school climate. Uh, Next year, we're going to be hoping, hoping partnering with RAVE to expand our homework club. Um, that was a wonderful um, partnership this year. We had high school students come down to Rainy Middle School and uh, offer help to some of our students who needed to little help with their homework. And we're hoping that next year we can uh, expand it by using some of our eighth graders as well. Uh, I need to thank uh, RAVE for their help with that and, and getting that off the ground. And that is, I think I have all of them. Yes. I would ask that the school committee vote to approve the Rainham Middle School School Improvement Plan. Do we have a motion? I'll move. Good evening again. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the members of my school council, Ms. Lynn Bastoni, our assistant principal, our uh, teacher representatives, Ms. Christine Onini and Mrs. Kelly Pedersen, and our parent um, organization, people who helped us out, whether uh, Mrs. Kathy Polk and uh, Mrs. Ashley Maloney. In terms of uh, increasing, uh, improving student achievement, we're gonna be focusing this year on the curriculum alignment to the uh, common core standards um, in all academic areas, creating uh, curriculum maps in all curriculum areas. We're going to provide teachers uh, the content-based collaboration time during our academic support blocks, our faculty meetings, and professional development uh, day opportunities. We're also going to begin using and utilizing the uh, Galileo software that Mr. Thompson just spoke of to start creating common uh, formative and summative assessments based upon the uh, common core standards. 
In terms of uh, development of personal and um, areas of social and emotional development, we're going to continue to build upon and refine our comprehensive anti-bullying plan and task force efforts with a focus not only on anti-bullying prevention, but positive citizenship and community service projects within the building and the community. One idea that we have is that each academic team would adopt a year-long community service project that they would do within the building or within the community. Um, our third goal in uh, creating stronger partnerships with stakeholders within the BR community is our belief that communication is a key element in developing and strengthening the home and school relationship. So we'll be recreating a parental mass email distribution list that is our uh, way of a paper-free way of communicating from school to home. We'll be inputting this information uh, that will be provided to us through the student emergency forms that are handed out at orientation and come back the first week of the school year. And we'll be sending out uh, weekly email blasts to uh, parents that will inform them of upcoming events. It'll also include our bi-monthly parent newsletters and hopefully this will uh, cut down on the amount of instant alerts that we need to send out throughout the community. Um, and uh, as far as developing a strong partnership too with the, the Bridgewater State University, we feel as though we have an incredible resource right in our own backyard and we really want to tap into those resources, especially for our after school enrichment program. Our incredible um, enrichment coordinator was Diane Power and I sat down a few weeks back and we discussed um, involving the college students in our back to school homework assistance program, as well as our uh, other areas of enrichment. And finally, um, providing a safe and orderly environment that promotes success for all students. We'll continue uh, to conduct our bi-monthly administrative meetings with our academic teams. Every two weeks, Ms. Bastoni and I meet with the academic teachers and discuss academic, behavioral, and truancy issues with uh, students within their teams. We'll also continue our meetings with Supervisor and Attendance, Mrs. Mary Bogle, on a monthly basis. And we'll continue to our efforts into our orientation programming for our students so that they become acclimated before the school year begins. Our seventh and eighth grade um, summer orientations will be in place again this year. Ms. Bastoni last week put together an outstanding sixth grade step up day for our incoming seventh graders that will now be an annual event. A PowerPoint presentation of a day in the life of a BMS student was presented. A guided tour by our anti-bullying task force was, uh, um, took place, and also the students were allowed to go to the cafeteria to purchase a snack so that they can get acclimated to how the process of our cafeteria works. So that is it. Thank you, Mr. Coons and Dr. Forrest. I would ask that the school committee vote to approve the Bridgewater Middle School School Improvement Plan. We have a motion. Mr. Mayor, the teacher, second by Mrs. Layton. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So vote. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. In front of Ms. Wilson. <coughs> Good evening again. Um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the outline. Um, our first set of, of um, Improvement goals are all based on the core value number one of the district, which is obviously improving student achievement. We broke it down from 1A through 1G. Each department takes ownership of, of certain improvement goals. We've got math, ELA, science, technology, and engineering, history, foreign language, business, and physical education and health. Our second goals um, focus on personal growth of students. We are going to continue to develop a healthy social emotional sense of being in all students and continue to develop and demonstrate, have students develop and demonstrate the necessary skills to transition successfully into the workforce. Um, a big push next year, in addition to aligning the curriculum with the Common Core, is going to be on um, college readiness and workplace readiness after students graduate. Our third goal is based on collaboration and partnerships, and we're gonna continue to build partnerships among families, the community, businesses, and staff. Our fourth goal on the school climate is broken into two parts. The first one is to create a positive student-centered learning environment, and the second is to provide a safe learning environment for all students. Um, our fifth goal is to maintain a long-range facilities plan which supports teaching and learning. And goal six is technically based on all of the district core values as well as all of 
the high school's core values, and it's to maintain the NIAS um, accreditation. As you are aware, next year is our self-study year, so a lot of goals in addition to what we put down here um, are, are gonna be worked on based on the NIAS visit coming up in 2012-2013. Um, I'll get you the whole plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving? <coughs> any opposed? So voted. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And. I'm not paying attention. All right, we know you are. We'll make sure you can. <laughs> and I think we're in a little stretch here. We got an acceptance of the grant. This is Kaylee. Thank you. I would request at this time that the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District School Committee approve the receipt of the Academic Support Summer Grant. We've been fortunate enough every year to apply for the grant and receive it. This year we're receiving an amount of $6,600. It's going to be used to support students who have experienced academic difficulty in grades 9 through 12. And again, as we have done in the past, the program is going to work towards closing the achievement gap for those students. Um, they'll be targeted students. They've already been um, in the process of being identified by Mr. Barber and his guidance staff. And what will happen is they will be working with them in small group tutoring or even one-on-one -on -one tutoring um, through the summer months. So I would ask acceptance of the grant by the school committee. Thank you, Mrs. Paolini. Recommendation, Dr. Forbes? Um, to approve the grant, please. Motion. So um, about a month ago, a parent had uh, contacted uh, with us donating our assistant principal about wanting to make a very generous donation to our school. At that time, the dollar amount was $5,000. Since then, the parent has actually is willing to donate $10,000 to our school. The family does wish to stay anonymous, and the, the funds would be used for um, reference materials for the library and also for our incentive plans for anti-bullying and positive citizenship award um, pizza parties and whatnot throughout the school year next year. So we're looking for approval 
for this gift. Yes, I recommend that the school committee accept an anonymous $10,000 donation for anti-bullying activities and for library resources. And we have that as a motion. So moved. This is late to second. Second. Second, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Freeman, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And a letter can be sent to them thanking them so much for their generous donation. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Freeman. accept a donation from an organization called Furniture Trust, and they would like to donate to the district 17 file cabinets, nine storage cabinets, three computer tables, four AV cards, 19 conference chairs, and one bookshelf. Just briefly, I know everyone wants to go watch the end of the game, but Furniture Trust, just in case you don't know, is an organization that collects furniture from businesses, government agencies, and other organizations, and donates the collected furniture to schools and other non-various non-profit groups. If you'd like further information, they do have a website. It's called thefurnituregroup.org. So that's my request that we accept those that furniture. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Here's the mic back. I recommend to the school committee that you approve uh, the acceptance of the donation of furniture from the Furniture Trust. We have a motion. So moved by Mrs. Layton, second by. Dr. Kulodowski, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? So vote if not, again with a letter of appreciation to yes. that uh, donor. I would much. also, um, at this time, like to ask um, Ms. Nancy Kirk to come down. We have another gift. Oh my goodness, this is my Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, the gift that I would like to have you accept is from the Friends of Williams. And actually, I think I'll just do this for uh, Mr. Spence and Anna because they have um, been very generous with us. And they had a wine tasting, and the purpose of that event was to raise money for technology in our buildings. So they are donating approximately $6,500 to each building for a additional computer lab that would have approximately 30 to 33 computers in it. Thank you, Mrs. Kirk. Dr. Phillips. I recommend that the school committee approve uh, the gift, and um, I'm very excited about that. Excellent. <laughs> Motion to approve. So moved. Mrs. Layton, second. Dr. Kriwandowski. Sure. Any discussions? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Personnel. Before we get there, I would just like to say one thing. We have a tremendously generous community so, uh -huh. that supports our schools, and I am very grateful and would like to thank everyone who has <clears throat> made a donation to us over the course of the year. Um, it really does speak highly of both of our member towns because of their commitment to our children and to their education. So uh, on behalf of the district, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And a letter of appreciation to Williams. Uh, yes. Williams. Williams. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. And now personnel. <clears throat> it is my distinct pleasure to announce the um, successful candidate for the uh, Merrill Elementary School principalship. This candidate holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Bridgewater State College, a master's of education from Fitchburg State University. She serves as the assistant principal at the George H. Mitchell Elementary School, and she has served in that position for the past three years. Obviously, you know I am speaking about Mrs. Latondra. Prior to that, she was the assistant principal at the Mary Good School in Middleborough. Mrs. Latondra served as an elementary classroom teacher in East Bridgewater for seven years. 
She is a dedicated, competent, energetic, and knowledgeable administrator in early childhood education. She is an integral part of the Mitchell School community who consistently goes above and beyond expectations, exuding a positive attitude and a tireless work ethic. Her references use words to describe her as poised, knowledgeable, enthusiastic, understanding, warm, warm sense of humor, privileged to work with, respected, and that she understands the value of volunteers in school. In fact, Mrs. Latondra has trained over 900 parent volunteers over the past three years. At Mitchell School, Mrs. Latondra has been responsible for initiating the school-wide reading incentive program, monthly newsletter, and school calendar. At the district level, she has facilitated the district-wide standards-based report card initiative K through four, and worked on developing the grade level standard pamphlet. I am pleased to have her become principal of the Merrill School effective December, uh, I'm sorry, January 1, 2000, 2012, <laughs> and I believe that she will be a tremendous asset to the school and to our administrative team. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Standing up wasn't necessary, but I appreciate it. Um, I'm very honored and excited to uh, be replacing Mrs. Tripp. Um, I'd like to thank the school committee, Mrs. Riley, the uh, school committee board, Dr. Forbes, Don Haley, and Kathy Petito, and of course, Brian Lynch for all their support um, and all the praise and opportunities um, Mr. Lynch has given me to grow as an administrator. Um, I'm very excited and honored um, to follow the footsteps of Mrs. Tripp, um, who has been a professional leader for many years in Rainian, who is also considered an icon. Um, big shoes to fill. Um, I look forward to the rewards and challenges of being an elementary principal in the Rainian schools. Um, and Mrs. Tripp and I, she so graciously offered to work closely with me so we can make the transition as smooth as possible for the um, parents, the students, and the community members as we transition from December to January. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the opportunities. Thank you. Maria 
Cordra Vetus as the Human Resources Manager, effective July 1, 2011. Dan Buron as Athletic Director. He served as the interim and um, he will be continuing on as the Athletic Director, effective uh, July 1, 2011. Uh, Peter Smith has been appointed as our Certified Athletic Trainer, effective July 1, 2011. And Amanda Bishop has been appointed as a Spanish teacher at the high school, effective August 29, 2011. I also have two resignations. Uh, the first is Rosemary Hagius, a math teacher at the high school, effective June 30, 2011, after four years of service. And also Andrea Easton, a fourth grade special ed teacher at the La Liberté Elementary <coughs> School effective June 30th, 2011, after two years of service. Um, I have the following resignations for retirement purposes. Um, Ms. Donna Paolini, Director of Administration, Curriculum and Grants. She serves the district um, district-wide, and the effective date for that will be June 30th, 2012, after seven years of service. I must say that this will be a very difficult thing, but we will transition um, that position. Um, Steve Guarino, who is serving as the head custodian at the high school, will be uh, retiring effective August 30th, 2011, after 19 years. And Deborah Oleen, a school psychologist at the Mitchell Elementary School, will be retiring effective December 31st, 2012, after 23 years. Those resignations have been accepted. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Is anyone, member of the board, with any other business to bring forward at this time? Seeing none, before we accept the motion to adjourn, and just again, um, as we conclude the 2010-2011 um, school year, thank you to all of the administrators and the teaching staff and the support staff in our schools all of the students, and all of the community members and the volunteers that uh, make our schools work. Thank you to everyone. And with that, take a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. This is Layton, second by Dr. Casey. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.